Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for being there here that early in the morning. So, I was asked to give a presentation on the future of the field regarding the biological foundations of intelligence. I will probably not give a comprehensive presentation on everything that is out there, and actually we heard quite a bit yesterday already. I will partly refer back to some of the talks that we had yesterday already. I will probably speak half of the time about the neurological foundations, the neuroscience of intelligence, and then uh, head over to the behavior genetics of intelligence and what we know about the genetic foundations of intelligence. Now there are certain things that we really know by now about biological foundations of intelligence. We're interested in how the brain solves problems, solves puzzles, reasons, and uh, we know that cognitive tests uh, basically always correlate, that we have the positive manifold and that we can extract a defect of general intelligence. That is probably one of the most uh, or best established findings in all of psychology. So when I'm talking about intelligence here, I will mainly refer back to general intelligence. I'm not so much speaking about specific abilities today. And of course, oops, that's the wrong one. And of course, we know that the brain has a lot to do with it, that somehow our cognitive abilities originate in the brain. We often assume a one-directional causal relationship there. We know that it is possible that there's a little bit of uh, relationship in the opposite direction as well, in terms of, for example, that experiences shape neuronal plasticity. And there are some good examples, for example, the classical uh, long taxi driver, drivers that have bigger hypocampuses due to their uh, spatial navigation experiences. And we know that there are substantial genetic effects on intelligence, especially general intelligence. Of course, there are also genetic effects on the brain, both of them really on the high end of the scale, though I usually I'm not that interested in uh, interpreting differences in heritability coefficients simply because they are always also environmentally dependent. And we know by now actually that the genetic influences on the brain and on general intelligence overlap quite substantially, that there are very high genetic correlations uh, both for global brain size and for specific uh, brain areas. So these are things that I will more or less take for granted, just to fill you in if you're not that experienced with the topic, but I think these are things that most of the room know very well. Now, another finding that I will refer back to at some points is the very high rank order stability of intelligence. The best evidence for that comes from the Scottish Mental Services that uh, provide census data on intelligence for 11-year-old children in Scotland and that have been discovered by Ian Deary and his colleagues and uh, exploited heavily since then for, for example, studies of the longitudinal stability of intelligence. And this is actually one of the participants in the study at both age 11 and age 79. And if you correct um, this uh, rank order stability for intelligence for restriction of range, which you can here because it's census data, then you have a uh, um, stability from age 11 to age 79 of 0.73 and they by now also have data up to age 80, uh, age 90 from the same sample and the stability is still 0.67. So there is a substantial, for some surprisingly substantial amount of variance in intelligence that is stable across the lifespan. This only as background, mainly I want to talk about the neuronal and uh, genomic foundations of intelligence differences and the most robust finding in this area is actually simply overall brain volume or brain size. It is probably the roughest measure you can get of the brain and it is certainly historically the one that uh, was used and studied first even before the days of uh, magnetic resonance imaging, simply because you can get it even uh, without fancy scanners. Nowadays, we use MRI to estimate 
overall brain volume. And if you meta-analyze that literature, I have to correct Sharif Karama yesterday slightly. It's not robustly 0.3, but it is robustly something like 0.24. At least that's what Jakob Pichnik and um, some others, including me, have found recently. So we know that higher intelligence goes along with larger brains. That is robust. But it is actually, I would say, a more puzzling finding than most people think. Most people take this for granted, especially since our species has the largest brain of any uh, primate species and has a very large brain compared to other species, especially if you correct for body size. So for some evolutionary reasons, our brain was select selected to become bigger. And it makes intuitive sense that it has to do with our uh, intelligence. But in some way, it's also a puzzling finding because we don't really know what it is that makes a larger brain more intelligent. Why is it that simply more volume gives you higher cognitive abilities? Now, of course, we know a little bit more about uh, this relationship than just overall brain volume. We know that both white matter volume and gray matter volume, so both the nerve connections between brain areas in mass and um, the number of neurons, the number of nerve cells, have something to do with overall brain volume. We also know that overall brain volume is more determined by cortical volume than by subcortical volume. Uh, and we also know that it is mainly actually the number of neurons that makes the human brain and also individual human brains bigger than others. We know that basically the structural design of the human brain is just an inflated version of the standard primate brain design, at least on a structural level. And for some reason, these small neurons make our species more intelligent and make individuals within our species more intelligent. But we don't really know why. We don't really know what it is with more neurons that allows the brain to develop higher cognitive functions. And there are actually some puzzling, uh, slightly puzzling um, examples where it isn't the case. For example, in the clinical condition of megalencephaly, which is basically an overly inflated brain that usually goes hand in hand with reduced cognitive functions. And even more famously, we know that there's a robust sex difference in overall brain volume. Ten, men have, uh, on average, a 10% bigger brain than women, still in representative samples that cover the whole range of intelligence variation, you usually don't find a uh, mean difference between the sexes. And overall, this points, together with other evidence, that there isn't really a one-to-one -one relationship between brain size and intelligence, that you can't really take brain size as a substitute for general intelligence, or that you can't really simply estimate uh, general intelligence just by measuring somebody's brain. It is robustly correlated with it, but you need other indicators to really cover the same construct. Now, of course, you can dig deeper and see what it really is about overall uh, cortical volume or overall brain volume that uh, links to general intelligence. And we know a lot about overall cortical thickness and of overall cortical area. Sharif Karama spoke about that yesterday already, and he told us that overall the relationship between cortical thickness and general intelligence is a linear one. But actually, it works much better if you have regional cortical areas. We'll come back to that uh, in a minute. And not so much if you look at overall cortical thickness. Actually, it seems to be the case that overall cortical area of the whole cortex is a better predictor of general intelligence than just cortical thickness. And here's a study that recently, uh, that was recently published by Mukosima and colleagues that used twin sample to look at this relationship. And they basically showed that cortical area, uh, when, when you put cortical area and cortical thickness together in a regression equation, that it's only cortical area that remains significant. And that that link is both for genetic correlation reasons and unique environmental correlation reasons. And actually, 
Often in this literature, the genetic correlations get emphasized more, but I actually find the unique environment correlation equally, if not more, interesting because it basically means if you have monozygotic twins that are identical and one of them has, for whatever reasons, a higher cortical area than the other, a larger cortical area than the other, that twin will also be higher on general intelligence, whereas when you just have a genetic correlation, that will not be the case. So if you want to deduce some sort of causality, or at least quasi-causality, from these kind of correlational designs, uh, then you need to look for unique environmental correlations. So genetic correlations basically just tell you that the same genes are behind it, but not that actually a larger particle area actually does something that uh, makes an individual uh, higher on general intelligence. So I think we should emphasize these kinds of correlations more if we ever want to get at something like uh, causality in this literature. Now, <coughs> cortical thickness does relate linearly to general intelligence, especially when you um, look at regional cortical thickness, and it is certain kind of regions that are simply High, more highly related to general intelligence than others. This is actually exactly the same slide um, that Sharif uh, showed you yesterday already. It's a study uh, on which we collaborated. Uh, another picture from this uh, paper that he didn't show you is this one. It is the same sample and it is the same cortical thickness measures, but it is IQ data from that sample at age 11, whereas this was age 70. So that basically means, as you see here, that more or less the same cortical thickness correlates appear when you take brain scans from age 70 and IQ measures from either age 70 or age 11. So childhood IQ already correlates with the cortical thickness of participants uh, almost 60 years later. And that basically means either cortical thickness is completely stable, at least rank order stable, over the lifespan, or there's actually something about intelligence that predicts cortical thickness or the brain condition, or there's actually something like a common cause that influences both things in the long run. And I'm actually leaning towards the last interpretation. I hope I can convince you about that by the end of the talk. Now, actually, to... Uh, bring the story home, if you control age 70 IQ for age 11 IQ and look at the correlates with cortical thickness, everything disappears. So it is really that we are tapping into the same thing here. Now, regional cortical thickness is not much of a localization of intelligence. And actually, there is quite an extensive literature on where in the brain intelligence is by now. And the best summary of it is still Jung and Higher 2007. 2010 in our Nature Reviews Neuroscience article, we updated it a little bit. And these are basically the brain areas that show replicable significant relationships, green in the left hemisphere, red in the right hemisphere, with general intelligence. Jung and Heyer proposed the perieto frontal integration theory based on these findings and tried to interpret a little bit what brain areas these are and what they do for intelligence. So they are saying you have the uh, auditory areas in the temporal lobe here that basically give you the auditory or vocal input uh, for situations where you need general intelligence. Equally, you have the occipital lobe here with the visual areas that basically give you the visual input. Those pieces of information get integrated, elaborated, and used for abstract thinking in the parietal lobe in these areas, and then you have all the frontal areas that are uh, probably the most classic correlates of cognitive function that relate to comparisons of response alternatives and to uh, response engagement, so basically working memory functions. And Jung and Heyer says all of this has to work together, has to be orchestrated, and for that you need connections between these brain areas that allow information to travel and to get integrated, and that is basically what the mind matter, um, the long association fibers, um, allow our brain to do. So the most fundamental message of the PFID theory is that intelligence is not in one 
single or a few single areas in the brain, but is basically um, supported by a neuronal network and so that you need large parts of the brain working in orchestration for general cognitive function. I'm sure you probably know this theory by now. I think mm -hmm. this is the best idea that we have about the neuronal foundations of intelligence and it actually gets more and more support, uh, most recently by a meta-analysis analysis of Ulrike Baston, who is also here and who will actually speak uh, right after me. And uh, she and her colleagues showed that uh, the PFIT theory holds very well up if you do a quantitative meta-analysis of both the structural and the neurofunctional correlates uh, of intelligence. She also found some other brain regions that were not in the initial uh, human higher analysis, especially some parts of the midbrain. Uh, but by far and large, the PFIT model is very well supported by this meta-analysis. Some of the best evidence that supports my opinion is a study by Glesher and colleagues that was already published in 2010. They used patients that had some sort of lesions in their brain, so basically damages or little holes in their brain for very different reasons. And they found a total of 241 patients who had different lesions in the brain and who also have been extensively tested with a Wexler cognitive battery. And um, they used a technique called lesion mapping where they basically aggregated all of these results and looked what overall pattern there is when do lesions in certain area basically decrease general intelligence or IQ in this uh, case um, uh, more and when do they have a less severe impact. And by far and large they interpret their results also as support for the PFIT theory so it was mainly uh, lesions in frontal and parietal areas that were proposed by this model already that reduced general intelligence more when damaged. Now um, the other bit that is important for the PFIT model and that actually comes out as a more and more fundamental correlate of uh, general intelligence is actually white matter. Here you see the whole white matter tracts of one single individual extracted from diffusion tensor imaging. And we can study white matter with diffusion uh, tensor imaging in a way that we get an idea of the structural integrity of these white matter fibers. So basically how uh, in, in what condition the cables in your brain are that transfer the information between different areas. And that is something that I uh, worked a lot on while I was in Edinburgh. And we had a large study where we used three different uh, MRI techniques to get at different aspects of white matter integrity. The by now most standard one is fractional anisotropy based on diffusion tensor imaging, which basically gets you information on the direction of the flow of water molecules in the brain. The white matter tracts are highly structured, um, yeah, highly structured parts of the brain. They work a little bit like little tubes, so water <laughs> molecules uh, basically go alongside the um, white matter fibers. Uh, as long as they are in good condition. If they are not so good condition, they can basically uh, move in different directions as well. The other one was T1 relaxation time that basically gets your information about the water content in the brain areas. And if your white matter fibers are in not so good condition, then they are a little bit more soaky, to, so to speak. And the third one was uh, magnetization transfer ratio, which is a good technique to measure macromolecules, so larger molecules in the brain. And in the region of white matter tracts, um, these are mostly the oligodendrocytes that uh, make up the myelin shaft, the isolation of the cables, so to speak, that allow for faster information transfer. We used a technique called uh, probabilistic neighborhood tractography to get this information alongside 12 white matter tracts. And what I noticed is that no, none of the individual tracts uh, and their integrity related very reliably to uh, general intelligence, but that they sort of intercorrelated. And so I could get 
an individual factor for each of these uh, three techniques that basically factor analyzes 12 tracks, gets the general factor for them, and gives you information about brain-wide wide meta track integrity. And these three different uh, tracks with, uh, measured by different uh, so brain-wide uh, wide meta integrity indicators measured by different techniques intercorrelate only slightly but they independently predict general intelligence. All of these coefficients are significant and together they explain 10% of variation in general intelligence in a pretty large sample. And we actually also had measures of information processing speed. These were two measures of reaction time and one of inspection time that also formed a nice information processing speed factor. And we actually found that this information processing speed factor was even more strongly related to these three factors of overall brain wide matter integrity and actually that information processing speed more, more or less fully mediated this relationship. So, so much for white matter integrity. Actually one finding about white matter integrity that we had when we looked more at white matter lesions was that actually white matter integrity at old age and at age, so white matter integrity at old age not only related to old age cognitive ability but also to childhood cognitive ability again measured at age 11. Another indicator that is not used that often, at least outside the clinical literature, is actually looking at iron deposits in the brain. Iron deposits in the brain happen uh, when you have slight bleedings in the brain, so-called microbleeds, which is basically a sign of a cerebrovascular, yeah, slight cerebrovascular disease. So it is basically saying that some of the blood vessels that support your brain are not in a very good condition and have slight leaks. This is far, far from stroke or anything uh, strong conditions like this. It is just basically a sign that uh, there's, there, there are tiny things going on, and most people who have these kinds of microbeads that are actually pretty common in the population. Our older population was about 50% of the sample that had them. Um, most of these people are completely healthy, and it's only if you brain scan them that you see these iron deposits that basically accumulate over the lifetime because when uh, metabolic processes break down the blood in the brain, then they can't get really rid of this iron, which is mainly hemocytorin. So we developed a technique, especially my colleague Maria valdez um to visualize these kinds of uh, iron deposits, which basically show up around the basal ganglia. And what we showed is that um, the overall amount of uh, iron deposits in the brain related to both general intelligence and to IQ in old age, but it also related significantly to IQ in young age, and that is actually again a surprising relationship because these iron deposits have to build up over the lifetime. It is very unlikely that they were there in childhood already. Of course, we don't have childhood brain scans from these people because at that time MRI wasn't developed yet. But what this shows is probably again that there might be some biological common cause behind brain integrity here in the case of uh, cerebrovascular integrity and general intelligence. And actually if you control for H11 IQ, you get a bit of a remainder relationship. So there is an aging effect, an aging process going on here as well. But still there is some stability of this effect over the lifespan. Now I'm won't talk very much about functional correlates of uh, intelligence in this talk. It's not really my area of expertise, but I want to say just a little bit. I think the best established finding in this area, no matter what kind of neuroimaging technique you're using, is that at least when you have tests of medium difficulty, that more intelligent persons use less brain resources be it measured in terms of uh, electrical activation, blood flow, or whatever, oxygen, oxygen usage. So basically, more intelligent people use their brains more efficiently to solve 
uh, the same cognitive tasks as uh, less intelligent individuals. There was a very nice uh, meta-analysis of that by Neubauer and Fink, which basically tells you most of the things you need to know about this topic. There have been some newer findings, again by Ulrike Basten, for example, that it is especially the inhibition of tasks, irrelevant tasks, that is done uh, better by more intelligent individuals or more intelligent individuals get to focus their brain resources more on the task um, yeah, when doing them. And actually this whole uh, neuronal efficiency hypothesis works very well with even newer techniques. I think state of the art at the moment are graph theoretical analyses of brain interconnections. And you can do that, for example, with a resting state activity in an fMRI scanner and uh, relate that to intelligence and the efficiency of the resting state network in the brain uh, relates uh, very well to general intelligence, not only the efficiency actually, but also the resilience, so how much of the, um, the efficiency of these networks you can disturb and still get good cognitive responses. I won't talk very much about these graph theoretical analyses, I think that is what Ulrike Basten will speak about right after me, but uh, that is probably state of the art when it comes to localization of intelligence. I just want to highlight the fact that intelligent brains are more efficient and actually that uh, intelligent, uh, br the brain networks of more intelligent people can actually be disrupted more, have higher resilience and um, uh, still lead to good cognitive results. So I want to give you an interim conclusion at this point. If I break this down to some very simple messages, I would say what makes a brain more intelligent? Well, certainly size in the form of higher cortical neural numbers, especially cortical neural numbers, and area. But also, and this is actually what I think is a very interesting point, integrity. So healthy development, lack of damage, no matter in whatever form, that is really something that explains intelligence differences, not only in the clinical uh, part of the population, but also in the general population. So more intelligent people probably have a brain that is in a better condition, has a higher integrity and have a more healthy development. And partly probably due to that, they also have a more efficient brain. And that all, if we want to localize it more, is actually stronger in the Pareto frontal networks, as correctly uh, predicted by Jung and Haier, which is a very stable finding by now, but it is basically size, integrity, and efficiency of this PFID network that localizes intelligence in the brain. Now, we have a lot of different indicators. Often the neuroscientific literature handles them independently, Actually, you can also throw them together as predictors of intelligence. Colleagues of mine in Edinburgh have done that uh, with the indicators that I also worked on for a long time while I was there. And they showed that you can easily predict something like 20% of variance, phenotypic variance in intelligence uh, by putting several uh, um, of these structural indicators of general intelligence into the same structural equation model. It's also interesting that they showed that basically it depends very much on which neurostructural indicators you put in there, how much of intelligence you predict, and that probably the predictions changes quite a bit. Roger Kiebit has written about that as well. So the relationship between neuronal indicators and intelligence follows a supervenience relationship, and uh, that is actually a reason why I don't think we are that close to predicting intelligence very well in individual cases from the brain, because you need a very comprehensive overview of all the neurostructural correlates and really need to put them all together. If you just focus on one of them, like brain size, you would probably not get individual diagnostics based on the brain um, very accurate. Now, I also think that we can get far beyond this 20% uh, threshold, even with what we uh, have right now. These analyses didn't include any functional indicators, and I think something like 30% is achievable even today if we had all measures in a single study. Now, this message of 
brain integrity, efficiency as the fundamental uh, neuronal correlate of intelligence is actually one that fits very well together with something else that I've been interested in for quite a while, and that is the idea of developmental stability as potentially indicated by something like body fluctuating asymmetry, that is basically the symmetry of the human body, of different body parts in body areas that are supposed to be symmetrical, that are symmetrical on population average. None of us is perfectly symmetrical, there are slight deviations, and if you aggregate them all across the body, which you can do by standard anthropometric measurements, then you actually get a meta-analytically robust relationship. It's very weak, which is expectable because body symmetry is a very indirect indicator of development and stability, but it is there, and it is there in two different meta-analyses. One of them actually led by Michael Daniel here. And I did some work of, on that as well with facial asymmetry. We found more relationships with cognitive aging, but overall, I'm pretty convinced that there is something there. I think the techniques that we are using are not really optimal. I've been experimenting for several years now with 3D body and face measurements. We haven't really come up with the right technique yet. It's a pretty tricky task, but this is something we're working on. But my message is here, it seems to be that some part of the biological foundation of intelligence is something like development and stability, or as Ian Deary likes to call it, system integrity. I actually don't see a big difference between uh, these two concepts. It's basically the idea that if your body is put together well and has developed very well, then it works better overall, including your brain, and the result of that is higher cognitive ability, higher general intelligence. Now, an interesting combination of these two ideas was published this year by Ron Yeo, who hosted last year's ISIR, and he actually looked at the symmetry, the fluctuating symmetry of cortical areas measured by cortical surface area um, analyses of MRI data, and he basically found that an overall um, now, I think brain overall cortical surface area symmetry didn't correlate that well, but especially uh, cortical surface area in the frontal parietal areas that were proposed by actually uh, showed a significant negative, as you would expect, relationship with general intelligence. So this is a new interesting approach to measure fluctuating asymmetry not from the body but from brain imaging data and I think that's readily doable with the data that is out there. I think this is some hypothesis that should be explored more in the existing data. Now, so much about the brain. This slide I showed you in the beginning already. Uh, and now I want to focus a little bit more on the genetics of general intelligence that to uh, a substantial degree are actually shared with the genetics of the brain. Now, where are the genes for intelligence? We heard quite a bit about that uh, yesterday already, and this is actually a slide we also saw yesterday already. This is the biggest existing uh, genome-wide association study for general intelligence uh, by Dale Davis and colleague that showed three genome-wide significant hits of common genetic variants from GWAS chips uh, in this analysis. I don't want to go into great detail here because you heard that all yesterday already. There is actually a larger GWAS for cognitive ability that was also mentioned yesterday already based on the UK Biobank data of 100, yeah, over 100,000 people. The problem is the cognitive measures in that sample aren't very good, especially the memory one is quite horrible, I have to say. The best one is probably the reasoning task, uh, but that was only used in the smallest sample. So in a way, it isn't the biggest uh, genome-wide association study yet, and you don't really get a useful uh, G-factor from the sample, which is quite a pity because otherwise it's a, a very amazing sample. But there, um, you also get some specific uh, genomic hits. But the interesting part is really if you not only call, uh, concentrate on this relationship, but take educational attainment into account as well. 
I think for this audience it's not so surprising that there is a relationship between general intelligence and educational attainment, even if you measure it very roughly and the genetic correlation is pretty high. We assume that the relationship often goes in that direction. To some degree, we also know that there's a uh, relationship in the other direction. There have been some studies of changing school systems, for example, where pupils were more or less randomly assigned to an extra year of schooling when the school system was changed. And we know that there is some bit of potentially causal effect of education on intelligence as well, even though I think this relationship is much stronger. And we know by now that the genetic correlations between these three parts are rather high, so it seems to be that it is really the same genes that affect the brain, general intelligence, and educational attainment. And that's why we can use educational attainment as a proxy phenotype when analyzing the genetics of intelligence. And that resulted, oh yeah, we're often assuming that the causal error goes like that, but again, we don't uh, really know it yet. And educational attainment actually resulted in the most exciting GWAS for this audience, I guess, and I think most of you are aware of this publication by Okbe in uh, Nature this year, because this GWAS found actually uh, 74 significant uh, SNPs for uh, educational attainment, showed that uh, educational attainment overlapped with general intelligence and actually also replicated at least 52 of these common genetic variants in an independent sample. So this is really rather uh, exciting evidence for the genetics of um, uh, general intelligence as well. Now, we can do a lot with these results. Robert Kloman talked about polygenetic scores yesterday and I think that's a a uh, worthwhile trajectory to go if you want to understand what's happening with this common genetic variants. But you can do more with it and I think one of the most exciting techniques is actually linkage disequilibrium score regression, a technique that was only published last year by an author that to my knowledge hasn't even received his PhD yet. Yet this technique is basically used in every genomic GWAS paper that is published since then. So if your PhD work uh, is routinely used in nature and science papers and you did something right even before you defended your PhD. I really want to know what the committee of this PhD student says because there's no debate about his contributions anymore. But anyway, linkage disequilibrium score regression is an exciting technique. David Hill talked about it a little bit uh, yesterday already that allows you to estimate genetic correlations purely based on GWAS data, on purely DNA information. And as you can see here, the educational attainment GWAS showed that educational attainment is substantially correlated on a genetic level with intracranial volume, which is basically overall brain volume, and also with cognitive performance. And these were actually the two largest, maybe aside from, I don't know, where the two largest uh, genetic correlations in the sample. So that's basically underlying, uh, uh, underlining what I just told you. Now, this is a slide that David Hill showed you yesterday already. I will only briefly repeat what he found in what he presented yesterday, actually a study that I was a little bit involved in. And he basically used the common genetic variants uh, in GWAS to look how those that show associations with uh, general intelligence in the charge sample are related to different uh, gene functions, as you can extract from gene data bands that have these annotations what these genes actually do. And you can group them by different functions or different yeah, annotations, basically. And the very interesting, and I think this is a rather revolutionary finding, I have to say, in the sample is that a large part of what common genetic variants in GWAS explain in general intelligence is not uh, somewhere randomly in the genome, but it is especially strongly in genomic regions that have been the same across species for a very long time. So these are genomic regions that are not only supposed to be the same for all of us, but that are the same for a lot of our ancestors and a lot of our uh, species that we are phylogenetically related with, 
which basically means that natural selection is working hard to keep these genomic areas just as they are, probably because they underlie very fundamental biological functions. And so this basically means um, these are regions of the genome that naturally selection doesn't want to vary. So 40% of the common genetic variants that we can find, you know, 40% of the uh, heritability of general intelligence is explained by only 2.6% of the SNPs and GROs that are in these evolutionary conserved regions. So I think this is a very strong message and I think we will hear more of that in the future. Now I want to quickly talk a little bit about um, the very low end of the IQ distribution because that is one that we now understand very well on genetic terms. This little bump of the IQ uh, distribution here at the end is intellectual disability basically and we now know a lot of individual genetic variants that explain a large part of all cases of intellectual disability. And this is a graph from a Nature Reviews genetics paper that showed how our knowledge increased over time, over the last few years, and we now can actually completely explain 70% of the cases of mental retardation, of severe decreases of general intelligence, basically, by uh, about 700 genetic variants that are mostly extremely rare. So these are often uh, genetic variants that only account for a few cases worldwide. But with these rare mutations, rare genetic variants that don't stay in the gene pool very long, we can actually conclusively explain 70% of the cases of the very low end of the IQ distribution. Now the interesting question then is, do these 700 uh, genes tell us anything about the normal distribution? So you can look at common genetic variants in these uh, 700 uh, genes that are known to relate to uh, mental retardation. It's actually also something that David Hill here has done, and he basically found no relationship, so it isn't the case that common genetic variation in mental retardation genes explains much uh, of uh, general intelligence. So this basically gives us an interesting theoretical question. So we know there are no single genes of large effects, neither um, or at least not that are common in the population. We know of large effect genes that are extremely rare and explain the very low end of the IQ distribution. And we use this now pretty well known technique of genome-wide complex traits analysis based on Gremmel uh, statistics that about 25% of the phenotypic variation in general intelligence can be explained by the SNPs and GWAS. First estimates were much higher, but I think this is the most realistic number now. Maybe it's 30%, but not much more than that. So about half of the heritability that we know from twin and family and adoption studies uh, for general intelligence isn't explained by these common genetic variants. So the question is, what is with the rest? There are usually three hypotheses, rare genetic variants, non-additive genetic variants, or gene-environment interactions. There's good evidence for genomic gene-environment interaction now for phenotypes like fertility. We don't really know much about non-additive genetic variants, but what about the rare genetic variants? They are actually what we would expect if we assume that intelligence has any relationship at all with fitness, with um, yeah, with, so that it's evolutionarily selected at all. And given that we know about so many important phenotypic links of intelligence and that we know that most of them are actually genetically mediated, it would actually be strange if intelligence isn't or hasn't been to some degree under natural selection. And in that case, it would actually be quite puzzling if all of the genetic architecture of intelligence was just explained by common genetic variants, because that is not what you expect from evolutionary genetic theory, I've written about that in 2007 already. Now, over the last years, I was quite puzzled because all the approaches towards rare genetic variants underlying general intelligence have shown null results. We worked a lot on parental age as a proxy of new mutations. Uh, my PhD student Ruben Arslan presented that last ISIR. There were studies looking at rare copy number variants overall in the genome, and I was involved in a study 
that looked at rare exomic variants and the overall burden. And none of these studies basically found anything, any relationships. So in the last few publications I wrote on this topic, I actually thought maybe uh, the genetic foundations of general intelligence in the broad population is actually not so much affected by rare mutations, probably because it's pretty well buffered, but that actually still throws up some puzzles about how much normal variation of intelligence can actually be under natural selection and would predict a lot of non additive genetic variants, which we sometimes find but not to that degree. So that was all still very puzzling. I quickly want to present you to newer results that actually convince me that there is something going on with rare genetic variants. Um, one of that is a study that is currently only on bioarchives. I'm not involved in that, so take it with a grain of salt. It still needs to go through peer review. But this is basically pooling together four samples that had genome-wide sequencing data or exome sequencing data and focused on exome sequencing. And they looked at genetic variants that only occurred once in that sample in the exome. So basically ultra-rare genetic variants, ultra-rare genetic mutations, and looked at educational attainment. They classified these genetic variants in the exomes as, uh, as either disruptive in that they led to a loss of function, as damaging in that they led to a change of the protein product of the gene, or as synonymous, which is usually interpreted as neutral. And they specifically also looked at highly conserved genomic regions, which is basically the same evolutionary conserved regions that David Hill presented about yesterday and I a few minutes ago. And here's what they found. So brain express highly conserved genes when they show these ultra-rare genetic variants in exomes that showed a significant relationship with educational attainment. It's here shown relative to loss of years of education, basically. It was not the case for non-brain-expressed highly conserved genes or overall brain-expressed genes. Similar pattern for damaging, a little bit lower because disruptive is worse than damaging, and no results for synonymous. So that is actually a very interesting finding. It's the first convincing study of rare genetic variants uh, that I've seen, and I think with the advances in genome-wide sequencing, we will see more studies of this kind. And they actually compared the effect size of these disruptive and damaging ultra-rare exomic genetic mutations compared to the polygenic risk score that we now have from these large GEO studies and to runs of homozygosity, which get you an idea of genomic inbreeding and pathogenic copy number variants. And the effect is there, and I think we can get it higher with better studies in that area. Sample sizes are pretty low so far. So I think there is something going on which we will hear much more about. So there is potentially much room for um, rare uh, genetic variant involvement in the genetics of general intelligence. So to quantify how much that is, I will finally present you a last study. This is based on the Generation Scotland sample, which is a very a uh, unique sample in that it is a large sample of pedigrees. It's 20,000 people nested in families. So these are whole extended family networks. But this uh, sample has also been GWAS. So for all of these participants, GWAS data is available. And um, um, Edinburgh colleagues uh, in genetics have recently published a paper where they simultaneously did genome-wide complex trait analysis and quantitative genetics based on pedigrees. They estimated sibling relationships, parent-couple relationships, and whole family relationships based on pedigree data with standard quantitative genetics and estimated these variance components simultaneously with genome-wide complex trait analysis based on GWAS data. And the one thing that this allows is actually that on top of these relationship-based quantitative genetic components and the standard uh, GCTA analysis, you can actually use all the individuals, even the closely related ones, for genomic comparisons based on the SNPs, so just based on DNA data. That is usually not done because you are afraid that uh, common environmental effects or any other kinds of family effects basically 
spoil your uh, GCTA results, but if you can control for these other variance components because you can estimate them directly, you can actually get this pedigree-based uh, genomic heritability uh, here as well because all the environmental information should go into these variance components. So this is a very interesting technique that not many samples are suited to estimate, but Generation Scotland can do it. And David Hill here did it for general intelligence in the sample. There's a pretty good G-factor. There are several cognitive tests that show a pretty nice G-factor. And this finding I find very exciting. So with these five variance components, you can actually explain 90% of the phenotypic variance in general intelligence, and there's good G-factor in the sample. There is some couple variance here, which is probably related to assortative mating. There's some sibling similarity, which is probably related to some sort of family environmental effects. This here is your standard GCTA heritability estimates. It's 25%, as we expect from other much larger GWAS studies. And this here is pedigree-related genetic heritability that is not captured by your classical GCTA analysis because it's genetic variants that are only shared by members within a family. So these can be rare genetic variants, rare mutations, these can be copy number variants, these can also be structural variants, but it's all the rare stuff that we usually miss when we do standard GWAS analysis. And this is about 25% of the phenotypic variance, this is about 30% of the phenotypic variance. And together they explain basically all of the genetic variants that we know from twin and family and adduction studies. So yeah, I won't talk about this any uh, much more, but for personality the picture looks very, very strange. And that is something that's puzzling me as well, but I don't really have time to go into that. So finally, my conclusion slide. I also told you brain-wise it looks like bigger brains, more neurons, higher integrity, healthy development, lack of damage, and higher efficiently, efficiency in parietal frontal networks is what underlies a more intelligent brain. And then we know that thousands of common genetic variants influence the brain, but simultaneously they are also involved in psychopathologies, education, and so on. And most of these genetic variants, a large part of the heritability uh, estimated by common genetic variants, is actually in highly conserved uh, genetic regions. And the same seems to be true for rare genetic variants, even though we have much less knowledge about it. But probably more of the heritability is actually in pedigree specific uh, genetic variants and not so much in the standard. G was genetic variants that we find, and that is very much in line what we would expect from an evolutionary genetic perspective if intelligence matters at all for something like fitness or natural selection. So overall, that basically points to more heritability probably being maintained by mutation selection balance um, than what we usually find in G was studies. So to give you an overall message for my whole talk today, I think that much of the biological foundations of intelligence actually look like something like developmental stability or system integrity, which actually points us in the direction that it's more a biological foundation of stupidity. So basically everything that makes an organism yeah, not so well developing, affected by things or a little bit damaged basically reduces general intelligence. We should actually see the biological foundations uh, from this side, and that's why we also know more about decreases in intelligence and not so much, for example, about giftedness or very high intelligence. And maybe there's a little bit going on there as well, but overall I think this perspective of intelligence as differences in system integrity, development, stability, or overall condition is actually a very promising one. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention.
the sewer G is a causal link variable here, right? How does this match these findings? How do they match saying mutual is a model? Uh, which there's not the mutual is more yeah. one for the mass at all. Uh, so how is it causal variable or what? you see G as a causal biological variables, unitary variable uh, causal I don't necessarily see G as causal variable. It's possible that it is causal, but it's also possible that it's all a common cause. And I think this whole developmental stability or system integrity <coughs> idea very much speaks to that. And I think some of the findings, especially the relationships between old age brain and childhood intelligence, for example, speak very much towards uh, common cause interpretation of the whole thing. So I'm rather impartial, I'm actually leaning a little bit more towards a uh, common cause interpretation. It could very well be that it is a little bit of both, and I still think the mutualism model is an interesting one. I think it needs more empirical evidence to say it is really the uh, better alternative here, but I can see both processes, so I wouldn't say that um, this speaks very much to that. Well, thank you very much, Larry. Okay.